So where might this go on day one of trading? Let's uh, break it down a little bit further here with Sarah Kunst, our next guest, Clio Capital Managing Director and a former senior advisor uh, to Bumble. And Sarah, appreciate you coming on here to chat with us. Uh, I mean, you just heard us kind of walking through the storyline with Bumble. Uh, when you go back and compare, though, I guess, to, to Tinder and maybe some of the other companies in Match Group, it's interesting to compare the growth rates, which kind of seems slower than what we saw with Tinder back when it was equivalent age. So talk to me about maybe uh, the direction this company is moving in, uh, in being kind of that woman moves first dating app uh, and how big that is in the space. Yeah, I mean, I think we can all relate in our personal dating lives, right? We we want quality over quantity, and and I think that Bumble's really been able to bring that, um, you know, and and uh, they are offering a product that, while the UX might not be massively dissimilar from some of their competitors, the brand promise really is, and and you know, I kind of liken it to the Teslas of the world. Tesla did not invent cars. It didn't invent electric cars. It just brought a brand and a form factor that, you know, users really, really love. And, and I think that that brand loyalty is, is going to be something that we see on display here today in their debut. And Sarah, of course, we've seen with this online dating space, it's not necessarily a zero sum game because users do, in fact, dabble in multiple apps that are out there. And yet it does feel like there are a lot of apps in the market. When you look at a company like Bumble, as it looks beyond dating right now, um, what are some areas for a real opportunities you think real growth beyond its core space right now? Yeah, I mean, you know, Bumble has made some some awesome moves uh, in in spaces like Bumble Biz, which is focused on business connections, um, Bumble BFF, which is is focused on friend connections. You know, it's really about empowering people to to go out and connect with others in their lives, and and they're doing that across several different facets, and and there is a lot of traction there. They even have the ability to download the app and to turn off dating so that if you, you know, are happily in a relationship, but you want more friends, you, you want to meet people to talk with on a job front, you can do that. And so, you know, where do you want to connect with humans and, and Bumble can help you kind of make those connections? Yeah, that's that was an interesting question I had, and I'm sure we'll get into this later on when we chat with uh, the CEO here on the show. But um, you think about BFF and maybe those business connections. I wonder how much more monetizable that becomes, um, because you know dating seems to be one of those things that more and more people have been paying. If you look at a Hinge or Match Group and the revenues on that side, seemingly easy to monetize. Uh, if it's guys out there, we know that men are more active on these apps when it comes to dating, and and we know kind of the statistics behind that. So I'd be curious to get your take maybe on on where monetization falls when we look at, you know, the last clip that they reported in their S1 was not profitable. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I think that over time, there's certainly a path to profitability in, in these kinds of companies. Um, and, you know, to your point, uh, dating is, is oh, people spend a lot of money. It's it's digital goods. You're paying for a monthly subscription uh, to get more features. You're paying for sort of immediate digital goods to tell somebody you really, really like them. They call it super swipe in the app. And, you know, it, it's similar to video game economics in that, you know, that the cost of goods on a digital good is incredibly low, which means the margins are really, really high. And so, so, you know, certainly in the core product, but then when you look at the other products, right, if if Bumble BFF is finding you a roommate, right, how much is a good roommate worth? How much is, uh, you know, finding finding your new best friend worth, right? And, and the ability to monetize, you know, and, and recently they were running a promotion for Valentine's Day around Airbnb experiences. So if you layer in, you know, even some advertising revenue or, or affiliate revenue, there are a lot of opportunities. Uh, most of the money we spend on experiences is with with other people. And so if Bumble's helping you meet those other people, the ability to, to you know, regain some of that income, I, I think is, is pretty strong. Yeah, it's interesting if you look at the S-1 filing, because retention was one of the risks that was mentioned. And sort of the irony being here that on the one hand, Bumble gives you an in to dating, and yet they list as a risk factor. If you find a relationship, well, then you don't need the app anymore. So so some of those avenues you pointed to uh, certainly would seem to offer sort of more traction uh, with users. But going back to just how crowded this space is right now, um, do you anticipate more consolidation there? You know, Bumble sort of created this, their own narrative it is female or ladies first, women first. Uh, but, but I wonder how many of these apps are able to survive on their own. Yeah, you know, and, and I think 
that that historically the the narrative was there's only room for one and that was you know not even match it was IAC inside of match and now we're seeing that there's certainly room for two so in five years will it be that there's room for three it certainly seems like it you know um the vast majority of of adults are in you know a romantic relationship at some point in their lives the majority of Americans still get married right and we know that younger demographics are changing that a little bit but the the desire for connection has hasn't gone away. And, you know, I personally much more enjoy being able to limit my dating to when I have a few minutes in an app versus spending, you know, an evening at a bar pre-COVID looking around to see, you know, is there anyone there I should meet? And, and I don't think I'm alone in that. You know, the success of Bumble, the success of Match as a standalone company says people are still out there looking for people to date um, and we're increasingly moving, you know, online to do so. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'll, I'll interject with my own personal uh, take here as well. I don't know if Kiko has anything to add, but uh, using both Hinge and Bumble over the last couple of years, experiences just seem to indicate much more interaction on Hinge, uh, you know, leading to actual dates. Uh, and I'm not sure how much of that stems from, you know, the, the woman first aspect of Bumble uh, versus some of the other dating apps. But I would be curious to kind of get your take on maybe you know, some of the other things we've been talking about, specifically dating apps in a pandemic. And I think that's strange for the way in which we're seeing Bumble. The timing of all this is, is difficult for investors to kind of weigh this out because they were profitable in 2019. We've heard about issues of dating on these apps in the pandemic, the risks associated with it. It's kind of difficult to tease out the trajectory that Bumble has here because of that, I think. Um, and what kind of boost might be there on the other side? Clearly a lot of demand. We saw Bumble up their price range for this IPO twice, and now the indication at $70. So maybe uh, project out if you can, and I know it's difficult, where the space yeah. goes in general on the other side of the pandemic. You know, when the pandemic is over, I think that the things that people miss, right, uh, most of us, you know, watching right now, we can still afford to pay our rent, we can afford to buy food, we miss having fun with other people, we miss touching other people, we miss going places, we miss a bunch of things that you kind of naturally aren't going to do alone. And the other reality is that you know, pandemics are really hard on relationships. And so, you know, we will also have on the other side, a lot of people who who are already coming out of it or come out of it and look around and say, maybe that person that I was with during this pandemic wasn't the right one for me. Um, so what's next? And so, you know, I think there's a ton of pent up demand because to your point, you know, it is somewhat risky right now to date during a pandemic. A first kiss could literally kill you, right? So that is a <laughs> risk factor on the other side of the pandemic. We're not going to have that. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> that sounds a little scary if you put it that way. But um, uh, Sarah, it's good to talk to you today. Uh, Sarah Coots, Clio, uh, Clio Capital Managing Director and former senior advisor to Bumble. And we, of course, will be speaking to the CEO of Bumble, Whitney Wolf-Hurd. She'll be joining us on the show a little later.